Now that we have an idea of the price quantity equilibrium, the prices are determined by the interaction of buyers and sellers in a market. We want to explain and illustrate those changes in demand and supply that are resulted of those non-price determinants, how those affect the market equilibrium price and quantity. We want to be able to explain or determine the impacts of price controls, price ceilings or price floors, and describe what is meant by uh, market failure and the role for government intervention in a market. So if we look at this competitive equilibrium uh, price and quantity, in the left-hand panel we have the market for uh, cruises, thousands per year, and the price is on the vertical axis and the quantities are on the horizontal axis. If we start out in equilibrium there with a price of $600 and 8,000 units being produced in the market. And we want to answer the question, what if advertising is effective in changing preferences of consumers? So preference, uh, the preference of consumers is impacted by uh, a marketing campaign that causes an increase in the demand. The increase in demand results in the, or the increase in the preference for cruises causes an increase in the demand curve, which is illustrated by a rightward shift of the demand curve from D1 to D2. When the demand curve shifts to the right, so the following would be for anything that increases demand, the demand curve shifts to the right, we move up along the supply curve to a new equilibrium point where the price has increased from 600 to 900 and the quantity has increased from 8 to 12,000 per year. So the increase in demand results in an increase in the equilibrium price and an increase in the quantity supplied. So that the market equilibrium price and quantity both rise in response to an increase in demand. The panel on the right shows the effect of a decrease in demand. This is because the price of gas, a complementary good, increases. There's a decrease in the demand for gas guzzlers. We can think of uh, big SUVs. Demand decreasing. What happens in the market when demand decreases? A decrease in demand is illustrated by a leftward shift of the demand curve from its original position at D1 to a new demand curve, uh, a new position illustrated by D2. A decrease in demand results in a decrease in the equilibrium price and a decrease in the quantity supplied. So a decrease in demand results in a lower price and fewer quantities being exchanged in the market. Let's look at changes in supply. An increase in supply is illustrated by a shift of the supply curve to the right. Looking at panel A, the left hand panel here, says if the equilibrium price is 9 and their uh, equilibrium quantity is initially 4,000, what happens when the supply increases? The supply increase results in downward pressure on the equilibrium price. The lower price results in an increase in quantity demanded so that the new equilibrium is one with a lower price and a greater quantity exchanged in the market. Conversely, a decrease in supply, illustrated here in panel B on the right, is a leftward shift of the supply curve from S1 to S2. The decrease in supply, the leftward shift of the supply curve, results in a higher equilibrium price. The higher equilibrium price results in a decrease in quantity demanded. Therefore, the new equilibrium is one with a higher price and a lower quantity exchanged in the market. So this is the picture that we can use to describe what happens when the price of a barrel of oil increases.
when the price of a barrel of oil increases, the supply of gasoline moves to the left, and the price of gasoline goes up as well. This is why we often see on the news, uh, this is why we care about what happens to a price of oil, because it directly affects the price of gasoline that many of us buy. There are two types of price controls that the government can exert on a market. One is a price ceiling and one is a price floor. A price ceiling sets a maximum price. An example of a price ceiling might be a rent control. Sets a maximum price that can be charged for a, a rental unit in a particular place. The result of a price yeah. ceiling, if it is effective, is that it causes a that the price ceiling causes a quantity shortage in the market. The quantity supplied at that price is less than the quantity demanded. So at a price, uh, the equilibrium price would be 600 in this example. However, the price ceiling prevents us from reaching a price of 600 because only uh, a maximum of $400 per unit can be charged in this market. The quantity demanded is 8 million and the quantity supplied here is only 4 million resulting in a shortage of 4 million units. A price floor sets the minimum price of a good. Minimum wage is an example of a price floor. Um, it says it's illegal to sell this good or service or resource for less than the, the price floor. So let's imagine that the minimum wage is higher than what would otherwise be the equilibrium, therefore preventing the equilibrium wage to reach that level of WE. If the minimum wage is, or the price floor is above uh, what would otherwise be equilibrium, the quantity supplied is going to be bigger than the quantity demanded. If the quantity supplied is bigger than the quantity demanded at that particular wage, that results in a quantity surplus in the market. In this case, more workers are willing to work for the wage than employers want to hire. This is what we call in the labor market unemployment. We should note that most We should note that most labor markets are not affected by the minimum wage. That equilibrium price and quantity that we showed through the interaction of supply and demand that, that will be reached absent any price controls is what we call the competitive market equilibrium. This gives the most efficient outcome. The quantity supplied is exactly equal to the quantity demanded so as long as these uh, transactions are entered, to, uh, entered into voluntarily, it results in the most efficient outcome that can be delivered. However, there are some times when a competitive market, uh, that market equilibrium, will not be efficient, and this gives us an argument for government intervention into the market economy. One of those reasons that the uh, market equilibrium might not be efficient is when there is a lack of competition or a monopoly in a market. We'll do a whole chapter on competition and another chapter on monopolies later on. We can see with some monopoly power though that it allows the seller to restrict output and raise the price of a good or service, therefore gaining at the expense of consumers and an inefficient outcome. So we like competition. Uh, if we like efficiency, then we like competition, and we don't like monopoly. So we can say that a monopoly power is a call for government intervention into a market because it gives us a less efficient outcome than a more competitive uh, market. We'll talk about that more later. Another market failure is called an externality. There are two types of externalities. Uh, an externality is when someone outside the transaction uh, receives a benefit or bears a cost 
If someone outside a transaction receives a benefit, we call that a positive externality. If someone outside the transaction bears a cost, we call it a negative externality. These outcomes are inefficient because the decision makers are not considering the full cost or benefits of the transaction. This is why pollution is a problem and uh, there's a call for government intervention when there is pollution. We have a, a firm that may be producing uh, something like steel, but then they're also producing pollution that imposes a cost on people who live in the neighborhood uh, around or, or in the area around <clears throat> the, the production facility. These people aren't buying or selling the good but they are uh, having a cost imposed on them. Therefore, the private decisions of the producers and buyers of the good will not include the cost of the externality. So there's a, a role for government to intervene when there's a negative externality. Similarly, if someone outside of the transaction is receiving a benefit, we would say that um, they're not incorporating that benefit into the cost or I'm going to say that they're not incorporating that benefit into the decision making process and therefore we're reaching an inefficient outcome there. The third market failure is one of the production of public goods. Public goods are goods that are non-excludable and non-rival in consumption. Non-excludable means that once the goods produced the producer can't keep others from using it whether or not they have paid for the good. The characteristic of being non-excludable results in what we call free riders, people who wish to consume the good without paying for it, and since it's not excludable, the producers uh, can't prevent it. This free rider effect will result in private markets not producing enough of a public good, that is, quantities too small will be produced smaller than the efficient amount. The idea that they are non-rival in consumption means that uh, the consumer doesn't use it up. So if we think about uh, something like a road being a public good, my driving over the road uh, to a large extent doesn't deteriorate the ability of anyone else to drive on the road. This uh, non-rivalrous nature of a public good results in too few of this being produced by the private market as well. So we have three kinds of market failures and, and three roles for government intervention. Make sure you finish the homework quiz for chapter four. Then we'll have a discussion for section one, the first four chapters of your textbook, and the exam will follow. Thank you.